live. We're live. <laughs> I'm reading out of Time Out of Mind. It's an autobiography of Joan Grant. She was a far memory writer. She wrote uh, famous novels or books uh, like Winged Pharaoh and Life as Kabula, Scarlet Feather, um, and a book about Moses, Before the Flood. She writes books about uh, because Winged Pharaoh played Before the Flood. And this is her autobiography because she had a lot of questioned, questions asked um, of how she got to write these accurate accounts of previous lives. So she is writing here about her life and we are now in part three of this book. And it's chapter one of part three entitled Secret Wedding. I stayed at Hartwood, Hertwood until the autumn and then went back to my parents, who a few days later took me for a holiday in London, where we stayed at the Cecil Hotel, which used to be next to the Savoy, overlooking the Thames, and it was there that I had one of the most important dreams of my life. In the dream I was sitting by a window, looking disco disconsolately at a mountain in the far distance. Behind me a door opened and a woman came into the room, a young and beautiful woman, with her hair in two long black plates falling over her shoulders. With her were two little boys, so exactly like each other, that for a moment I thought I had seen the same child twice. They were about ten years old, with dark eyes, although their hair was brilliant gold, in ringlets which re reached the white lace collar of their little velvet suits. I knew she was asking me to look after them for her. She kissed them and they ran towards me. Then I woke up knowing that the last words she had said to me were, go to Leslie, tell him his mother sent you. Tell him you know what to do. I had not seen or heard of Leslie since July, although at times I missed him acutely. Daisy had gently pointed out that as he wanted to marry me and I was determined not to marry anyone, it would be kinder to make a clean break and let him forget me. He had never said much about his family, but I knew his mother was dead and that his father had recently remarried. I also knew he had a twin brother who was at Oxford while Leslie was at Cambridge, but he did not play tennis and we had never met. If they were the twins of my dream, why had I seen them as small children and with golden hair, though Leslie, Leslie's was the same colour as mine? Perhaps it was not a true dream, only a fantasy which Joan had created so as to give herself an excuse for seeing Leslie again. Six fortune tellers had told me that I was going to die before I was 23. It would be cruel to let Leslie love me for two years only and then perhaps be nearly as unhappy as I had been when Ed Edmund died. I, loved, I longed to run to Daisy and ask her what to do. No, that would be unfair. It was my dream and my responsibility. Several times I picked up the telephone receiver and hastily replaced it without asking for Leslie's number. Was I really thinking of his feelings or only being too cowardly to risk being vulnerable again. I was being a coward and a conceited one at that, conceited enough to assume that Leslie would miss me as much as I missed Esmond. And even if he did, would I rather not have gone to Aldermatt? Was I so ungrateful for brief joy that I would rather not have had it, even for a little while? So. As not to waste any more time in indecision, I rang through to Mother's room, told her I had just remembered that I had promised to spend the day with Kirsten and was already so late that I couldn't come and say good morning and hurriedly left the hotel before she could ring back and argue. I paid off the taxi in Piccadilly and walked slowly to Hartford Street, for now I was very nervous. At the front door I nearly turned back, but the door was open as it had been on the day that Asmund died. 
I ran up the stairs and into Leslie's room without knocking. The moment he saw me, I knew that it had been a true dream. I tried to, I tried by instinct, I, I tried by indirect means to find out what was worrying him, but he was evasive. Nothing is wrong now that you are here, he protested. I admit I had highland gloom while I was up in Scotland. You wouldn't even answer my letters. This is more than Highland gloom. I know it is because your mother told me so. What on earth are you talking about? Mother died when Malcolm and I were two years old. I know she did. I saw her in a dream. Not down here. And I know you had gold ringlets and wore velvet suits with lace collars, like the illustrations in Little Lord Fauntleroy. Why did she die so young? She had typhoid but was supposed to be convalescent. We were all having tea in her room. Malcolm and I were sitting on the bed beside her when suddenly she gasped and dropped the cup she was holding. Her heart had given out. Have you seen her since? No, I haven't, he hesitated, hesitated. But I think Malcolm has. At last, he talked about her a lot. I tried to get in touch with her through automatic writing. I think he only does it because he is so miserable and ill. So he is ill, he nodded. He rode in the, in the Oxford boat this year. It sank, as you probably remember. The crew had a party that night and Malcolm fell off the top of a taxi and landed on his head. He got concussion, but instead of going to bed, he went on working for his finals, in spite of increasing headaches. He looked damned ill when he came up to Scotland, but instead of getting him properly vetted, AD, everyone calls father by his initials, prescribed fresh air and exercise. So he had to shoot four days a week, although the jar of the gun made his headaches worse. Where is he now? In a nursing home. He doesn't want to see anybody, even me. What about his father? Oh, A.D. has gone back to the Argentine, he said flatly. That's a good thing. We can cure him much easier without your father interfering. The first thing to do is to get him out of the nursing home. Think how the one I was in nearly finished me off when I had my tonsils out. But what can you do? Try to give Malcolm what Davy, Daisy gave me to me. I've prayed nearly every night since I went to Hertford, Hertwood that I may be able to hand on what I found there. Within three days, with the willing cooperation of Mrs. Mr. Blundell, the great grand family solicitor, who acted more or less as a guardian to the children when A.D. was in the Argentine, we had taken a furnished house near London and installed Miss, Miss Cazibon to run it for us. Casey had looked after the twins since their mother died and stayed on with the family until the previous year when A.D. remarried. When I first saw Malcolm, he weighed eight stone instead of his rowing weight of eleven stone six and was too weak to get out of bed. In a few days, he began to revive as though our ugly furnished house were another hurtwood. In six weeks, I knew that all he needed to complete his convalescence was a carefree holiday. Mr. Blundell, as well as Casey, was by now entirely convinced that I knew what I was doing, and so when I told him that I wanted to take Malcolm to the Mediterranean, he provided the wherewithal for us to rent a villa. The villa was easy to find, for Herbert Oliver, who had a house next door to Seacord, had two at La Mortala, near Ventimiglia, Ventimiglia, on the Italian side of the border, and was looking for a tenant for the larger one. It was after we had decided to take Malcolm abroad that I realised we had another problem to overcome. I had not told my parents what I was doing, for at the beginning I was following a hunch and was afraid of being put off my stroke of if mother tried to convince me that I was too young and inexperienced to take responsibility. And later, when I was more self-confident, it seemed a needless complication. 
They had not worried about me, for they thought I was either at Hurtwood or playing golf for Hampshire or Stoke Pages, which I did three or four times to lend colour to my cover story. But the story would have to be improved a lot before it would cover up a trip to Italy. Casey, fond as I was and am of her, was not the right person for the holiday I visualised, but Mother would never let me go off with Leslie and Malcolm without a chaperone. Suddenly I thought of Betty Stewart Lockhart, who at that time was married to David Joel. I knew Betty was working very hard with the new showrooms she and David had just opened in Knightsbridge for the sale of the modern furniture made in their workshop at Hailing Island. But as soon as I had told her the whole story, she agreed to drop everything and come with us. At first, Mother was quite willing to let me go with Betty. Then she began to hatch. I could go for a fortnight, perhaps even for three weeks, but I must be back in time for Christmas. Betty must promise to keep a strict eye on me and to bring me home at once if my father wished it. He needed me in the laboratory. I had already been too long at Hartwood with Daisy. Suddenly, maternal apron strings felt constricting as a tonicky. I would marry Leslie now, instead of waiting until I had asked A.D.'s permission, which he intended to do the moment that Malcolm had completely recovered. I would not wait for permission either. Father would mope and say I was too young. Mother could be talked round, for she liked Leslie, but she would insist on a proper wedding. It was on Saturday morning and we were leaving England on the following Thursday when I told Leslie we would get married before going to Italy. I was a little nervous, anxious that he might be afraid of offending A.D. But he was too delighted that he rushed me off to get a special license in case I changed my mind. When we had filled in all the answers on the application forms, the clerk looked at me severely and said that as I was underage, he could not issue a license without my parents' consent. We tried to bluff it out by saying I had absent-mindedly put 1907 instead of 1906 as the year I was born, but he seemed unimpressed and told me to bring my birth certificate when I returned with the requisite signatures. By now I was determined not to be thwarted by bureaucrats or parents. They could stop me getting married, but if they did, I would bolt with Leslie. I arrived at Seacott in time for Sunday tea, and when at last the droppers in had departed, I argued until midnight. Later, dear, when you know him better, when you have met his family, a June wedding, if you haven't changed your mind by then, you can't get married without a proper trussel, said Mother. Father sat silent at his desk and gloomed. At last I had to be rather brutal. You can stop me getting married until next April, but if you do, I will present you with a dear little illegitimate grandchild and try to make it twins. That beast won me game, set and match. Father cheered up, relieved to think that I had saved him from having to make a decision and said that at last I had spared him the torment of having to wear a top hat at my wedding. You must, both of you, come to it, I said generously. It will be on Wednesday, so you had better start packing if you're coming up to London tomorrow. There isn't much time. Can I tell anyone? Not even Margaret Oliver. She really ought to know, at, as Herbert is already in La Mortala, and she will be hurt if I don't tell her first, said Mother wistfully. No, darling, no one at all. Think how awkward it would be for Malcolm and Betty if they thought they were being gooseberries on my honeymoon. Not even Margaret, Marjorie and Iris? No, quite definitely no. Think what fun you are get going to have when you can break the news to everyone. You'll be the first mama to share in her daughter's elopement. That cheered her up. Already she was looking forward to a glorious spate of telephone calls. My dear, prepare yourself for a great surprise. Dear, Joan is married. When? Oh, weeks ago. Was it a shock on me for me? Of course not. 
She tells me everything. Jack and I were both there. Yes, of course we are giving a party to welcome them home. We relaxed our ban of secrecy sufficiently for Kirstein to be bridesmaid and Rex Jansen to be best man. She met Rex for the first time at our wedding and married him six months later. The only other person there, except my parents, was Mr. Blundell, who bravely, facing possible repercussions from the Argentine, even signed the register. We were married at 10.30 on the morning of the 30th November 1927, at the church in Down Street, because Leslie's rooms were in that parish. The church was cold and grey and ugly, no more magical than a station waiting room, and the parson, a horrid little man with a streaming cold, gabbled through the service to show his disapproval of what he obviously thought of as a hole and corner marriage. After champagne and an hour artificial heartiness at the Cecil Hotel, we hurried back to have lunch with Malcolm, who had no idea we were getting married, as I had suddenly remembered that his passport was out of date and that I had promised to go with him to renew it. On our way there, Malcolm and I ran into my parents in Piccadilly. I only just managed to stop them giving away my secret for never having seen him. They thought he was Leslie. I had forgotten to mention that they were identical twins. Okay, that's the first chapter of the third part of Time Out of Mind, Joan Grant.